Thank you. You may be seated. How little we understand the freedoms that we have here in this country. Praise God. A few moments ago, we read Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. I hope you were paying attention to it. This passage is often pointed to as our responsibility to be in submission to government, to the authorities that are over us. And indeed, that is the case. We have a responsibility as Bible-believing Christians to obey those whom God has ordained and placed in positions of authority. But as you read the passage, there are some very clear caveats that occur over and over and over again in these verses. Verse 1 lays down the general principle that every soul, that includes all of us, be subject unto the higher powers. Paul wrote that to believers in the city of Rome during the reign of wicked Roman emperors, some of whom later on began to kill Christians by the truckload. Even the Roman emperors are there by God's appointment. It says so, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. You say that's a rather broad and very purposeful statement of obedience to government. Is it untempered? Are there exceptions? Today the message is entitled Freedom and Tyrants. Verse 2 tells you what happens to those who disobey government. And that's true whether or not there are exceptions or not. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. So you're not merely resisting a human authority, you're resisting God himself. That became very clear as Moses spoke to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. They rebelled against him. And he said, you've not rebelled against me, you've rebelled against God. God's the one that put me here. You're in trouble. Paul is restating that for us here. They that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Whether you're right or wrong, you will be in trouble if you resist the government. But then we begin to discover there are some caveats in this passage. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Paul begins to describe for us the proper authority of government. The areas of government where we are obligated to obey. And he begins to show us there are some things where not only we cannot obey, but we must not obey. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. The purpose of government is to crush evil and promote good. If thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. The purpose of governmental power is to punish, even with the death penalty, those who do evil works defined by God. Not defined by government defined by God, because Paul is talking in absolute terms. What is good? What is evil? Not merely what does government say is good and what does government say is evil. Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. Government is to encourage that which is good. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth 
evil. Now, you can define your terms any way you want, but God has already given us the definitions concerning good and evil. God has already told us from the divine perspective what is good and what is evil. And God has told us what government is supposed to be doing. And some governments, even in Rome, did that which was good and suppressed evil. And here in the United States, that has been habitually our government's position to do good and not evil, to encourage good and to suppress evil. But things are beginning to change rapidly. We'll talk about that in a moment. There's a second reason to be obedient to those in authority and governmental positions. God has established different spheres of authority. At the bottom level, he's established the authority of the family. With the father as the head of the home, the mother as his assistant, the children under obedience. In the church, he has established authority. And the authority in the home and the authority in the church must obey the will and word of God. Otherwise, breaks take place. This church broke away from an organization that no longer can call itself a church because it does not function according to the word of God. Our country broke away, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The Declaration of Independence, dated July 4th, 1776, broke away from a country, and it was signed by men who understood the word of God and the rights and responsibilities of Christian men and women in the context of government. God has ordained the state, the church, the home, and also employment. Paul talks about those responsibilities for those who are working for someone else. Spheres of authority. Some of those overlap and some do not. Some overlap in one area but not in another area. The question is, are you articulate enough in the word of God to know how to function in each of these areas according to the divine standards, not merely the human standards that have been instituted for the operation of those different levels of authority. And he gives you in verse 5 the second reason for being in subjection to those in authority. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, that is, you're afraid to get smacked, that's what the government's there for, to smack the evildoers. But it says also for conscience sake. The reason that you and I are to be in submission to the authorities that God has ordained in each of the different spheres of authority is because God has given us a conscience. A conscience that knows the difference between right and wrong. He's been talking about good and evil. He's been talking about right and wrong in the text before us today. And your conscience knows the difference. Oh, we sear our consciences. We trample our consciences. We run over our consciences. We try to avoid our consciences. We shut our consciences inside a closet while we're busy doing something else. But if you want a clear conscience, a conscience cleansed by the blood of Christ, then you do what is right in relation to the civil authorities. That's what Paul says here. Render therefore to all their dues. And what's he talking about? He uses the word tribute there and also in the previous verse. He's talking about taxes. For this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers. Did you know they're God's ministers to collect tax? That's what he's talking about. And what do they most pay attention to? He says so, attending continually upon this very thing, upon taxes. 
You know that once a year, if you don't have your income tax filed, the IRS will come after you. If you cheat on your income tax, the IRS will come after you. If you try to hide things under the table, the IRS will come after you. They attend upon this thing continually. That's not one of the areas you can say, well, uh, I think that uh, I can get out of that because there are some exceptions to being in submission to governmental authorities. No doubt those at Rome thought that too. But that's not what Paul is talking about between the evil and the good. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Interesting, he moves from the law of the government to the law of God. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment. In other words, what is the ultimate law to which the believer must be in submission? What is the ultimate standard, the fluctuating standard of government permissions and government prohibitions? Or the ultimate standard that is characterized by the nature of God himself. The very fact that Paul adds that from the Ten Commandments here, Deuteronomy chapter 5, Exodus chapter 20, is because God has some permanent moral standards. Government has been instituted by God to insist upon God's permanent eternal moral standards. When government does not do that, government is not functioning as God ordained. We'll discover in a few moments that our founding fathers understood those principles when they signed the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776. And we we'll begin to understand what our responsibility is to our government as we see suddenly our government, not so suddenly, it's been going on for a number of years now, particularly in this administration, begins to deny, pervert, and insist on standards that are contrary to what Paul sets forth here in the Word of God and which was set forth under the law given by God on Mount Sinai to Moses when he gave the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not for your salvation. The Ten Commandments are not for your sanctification. The Ten Commandments are a national standard that God gave to show his moral absolutes and what he expects from a nation. Paul explains how we as believers are to function in the church in the same passage, not because of the Ten Commandments, but on the basis of love. Did you get that? Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Too many people, especially in Reformed circles today, place themselves back under the law instead of understanding that Christ fulfilled the law. Understanding that in Christ we have a new position. Understanding that in Christ our obligation is not merely to follow a set of rules. Our obligation is to go far beyond what the rules say by loving one another. Greater love hath no man than this, the man lay down his life for his friends. Love is sacrificial. It goes beyond the bare minimum requirement. Paul goes on, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. The American church has been asleep over these last eight years, and before that too. But especially asleep, the train has run off the tracks. It's high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Oh, Christ is coming back and we're looking forward to that, but we have much to do 
Look at verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. That's warfare terms. Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. If my people which are called by my name. You just heard it sung a moment ago. It's time for us to repent. It's time for us to get out of the darkness. It's time for us to live for Christ. It's time for us to take a stand. It's time for us to say enough when it comes to government abuse and wickedness and perversion and immorality and the promotion of all that God calls evil. You start by the way you live. That's what he says in the next verse. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. He lists just a few of the categories of sins in which Christians are involved. But put ye on the Lord Jesus. He's just talked about verse 12, putting on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus. And then a very important phrase. Too many Christians overlook it. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I heard the story many years ago of a man who had been an alcoholic. And after he got saved, he began to take a different route to work. And a different route home from work. It was a lot farther. It was a lot more difficult. And so some of his friends asked him, why do you do that? He says, because my old route took me past three or four of my favorite bars. And he says, I never want to go back that way again. He understood the principle. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. He knew he was saved. He knew he had the indwelling Holy Spirit. But he also knew that he had this old sin nature still there. And that he might be down one day and he might feel depressed or he might have just gotten a bad notice at work or maybe he was feeling sick and he just needed something to knock it all off and he'd go in and take that first drink and be back where he started. Make no provision for the flesh. Did you used to look at girly magazines? And you got rid of most of them but you still have one that was your favorite. Did you used to embezzle a lot and now you have opportunity to get a little bit just because of the way that your operation at work is set up? Change your route. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Our scripture today was from Romans 13. In that chapter, Paul gives the theological explanation of the Christian's responsibility to government, even when it is an evil government. The founders of our country understood the responsibility of the Christian to his government far better than most American Christians, and I think far better than most of us here in this auditorium. And yet they waged the war of independence against Great Britain and the king. How do we square what we have read with the establishment of the United States against the government that controlled them. Perhaps to gain a better perspective, let me quote from the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> let me ask you a question. When was the last time you read the Declaration of Independence all the way through? How many of you have read it? I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of you have read it all the way through within the last year? Nobody. Within the last five years? Oh, we got two who've read it all the way through within the last five years. Praise God. How many of you haven't read it since you were in civics class in high school? <laughs> That's most everybody. Okay. You know, God gave us some incredible men who started this country. Let me read you just a few lines from the Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another 
and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which, now listen carefully, the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and that accordingly all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Those words are followed by the specific causes and abuses placed on the colonies by the king. And if you read them, you'll discover that many of those abuses are uncomfortably similar to the abuses of our current government. The final paragraph of the Declaration of Independence contains these concluding words. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in General Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the World, for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connections between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And then skipping to the end, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Unquote. It should be patently clear, even to a casual observer, that the framers of the Declaration of Independence were relying on a higher law, a divine law. They call it the law of nature and of nature's God, in other words, the Bible, to supersede mere human law. Let me say it again. Did you notice that term? <clears throat> the law of nature and of nature's God. I hope you picked up something in that. 
Our founding fathers were creationists. They understood that there was someone outside of and higher than naturalism, which was certainly available and rampant during the time the Declaration was written. Listen carefully. One of the essential sine qua non elements of freedom is a creator God in charge of his creation. I'll translate the Latin for you. Sine qua non means without which nothing. One of the essential without which nothing elements of freedom is a creator God in charge of his creation. If you remove that, there is no rational basis for saying that the government, also known as Big Brother, there's no rational basis for saying the government is not the best solution for solving the problems of the world. After all, might makes right. Survival of the fittest. The educated and elite classes should obviously rule the world. Some races are more evolved than other races. There are no absolute rules, no permanent standards, no unchanging truth, and certainly no sexual absolutes. You see, without an external superior standard, there is no reason to resist fiat governmental declarations that the new moral standards are just as good and perhaps better than the old moral standards. When you leave out the Creator, who was central to the doc Declaration of Independence, when you leave out the Creator, the creature may define himself. Satan understands this, and as a result has made a concerted effort to annihilate the teaching of creationism in the public school system, to annihilate the teaching of creationism in the universities and academia. Creation scientists are boycotted, scorned, and ostracized, and their papers are rejected by major scientific journals, even if they're producing cutting-edge scientific research. Some have even been denied Nobel Prizes based solely on the fact that they were creationists. Now, I know you've heard me hammer this repeatedly and very hard over the past eight years, because I believe with all my heart that this is the one issue why we are losing our young people today. Why they're leaving the churches in droves. Why they are abandoning their faith. Why church children are involved in as much animalistic sexual immorality as their pagan counterparts. If we're only higher evolved animals, what is there to stop us from living like barnyard morals? I'm going to be blunt here for a minute. For eight years, I begged the boards of this church to begin emphasizing and to train our young people in creationism. The scientific evidence is for it, to show that the emperor of evolution is bare naked and has no clothes. I even boycotted summer Bible school last year because there was no movement on that issue. I praise God that this year the theme of our upcoming summer Bible school is dinolution. Dinosaurs, no evolution. I know we're going to get flack. We'll get opposition from the pagan god-haters of the world. When I have publicly advertised the adult classes that I have taught during past summer Bible schools on the subject of creationism, I've received many vicious and ugly phone calls from people who wanted to swear me off the phone. The same is true for the years that I held creation conferences in the fall. Men hate God the Creator because their deeds are evil and they do not want to be held accountable. I also praise God that this year the Presbytery will be taking a Faith Presbytery bus trip to the Answers in Genesis Creation Museum in Kentucky the first week in August. Let me pause for a moment and say I hope you have signed up for that trip. Tomorrow, the Lord willing, I'll be driving out to see the opening of the new Ark Encounter. A life-size replica of Noah's Ark, just 20 minutes from the Creation Museum. The pagans hate it. If you've been following that at all on the Internet, you've discovered that there are literally hundreds of newspaper articles and magazine articles and all kinds of blogs on various websites talking about how horrible this idea is. The pagans hate it. They raised the lawsuit against it. They tried to take away the tax-exempt status of answers in Genesis. 
They've done all kinds of things to try to stop the building of the ark. And they did that with the Creation Museum too. They can't stand it. You know why? The ark teaches two clear biblical pictures. Number one, judgment is coming. The ark is used not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well, to declare there is a God who will judge the earth. The ark teaches, number one, that judgment is coming. Number two, it teaches that God has provided a way of salvation, a way of escape in Jesus Christ, who is the ark of our salvation. And men hate it. Here's a prayer request. Pray for all those who have lifetime boarding passes. There are about 8,000 of us who have heavily supported the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. We have two days to see the Ark before it opens to the general public. Pray that all the security measures are working and in place. There are pagan terrorists who would be thrilled if they could penetrate security and kill people and destroy the reminder that judgment from God is coming upon this wicked world. Freedom is certainly an appropriate theme for this week as we remember the freedom that God has given us here in the United States. <coughs> Tomorrow we celebrate American Independence Day. It's with grateful thanksgiving that we, as United States citizens, Look back to 1776 and the establishment of our country as an independent nation. Freedom is a rare commodity in the world today. Think of North Korea, Russia, Communist China, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Cuba, Abu Dhabi, Somalia, Jordan, Lebanon, Burma, Indonesia, India, Multiple countries in Africa, South America, and around the world that are under Catholic domination. Islam, communism, and other pagan religions. Freedom is a rare commodity in the world today. But now, think of the United States where Christians are now on the defensive in court as they take stands for the divine standards of being able to speak the truth. That's what we just read in Romans 13. Such patently obvious things as that men and women are different, that God hates and will judge sodomy and lesbianism and those who practice those perversions, that grown men should not be allowed in the ladies' room with little girls, the teenage boys pretending to be transgendered should not be allowed to take showers with teenage girls. Our country where military chaplains are being dishonorably discharged from the United States military for giving biblical counsel to our armed forces. Where our country's leadership is pushing for the draft of teenage girls to be not only the physical defenders of our country on the front lines, which is absolutely stupid, but to have to bunk with the men. There was a push by our president, a concerted push, to rip away our Second Amendment rights every time a Muslim terrorist kills people, instead of pointing out that Islam and its followers are the ones who are killing the Christians and the Jews. Make no mistake, President Barack Hussein 
Obama is the enemy of biblical Christianity, although we must honor him for his office. Americans are historical illiterates. They have no idea of what we have already lost in the Obama administration's tenure. He promised change. Indeed, he has brought us change that he vaguely promised without defining it. Yes, indeed. He's put radical Muslims and homosexuals into some of the highest key positions in his administration. He's overridden Congress on matters where only Congress should have acted. He has packed the courts with anti-constitutional judges. I shudder to think of the options facing us in the upcoming election. That's why we need to pray for the salvation of the candidates. I think we're already over the cliff in free fall. What do you think our founding fathers would have done if they had been alive today? Do you think that they wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution so that transgendered persons in the military could have sex changes out of your taxpayer dollars? Freedom is truly a rare commodity, and it's getting rarer by the day in the United States. The Bible prophesies that there is coming a day in which true freedom will be totally extinguished from the world with the rise of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast where every human on the planet is tracked and controlled. The technology is available today and is being perfected with this goal in mind, the total removal of freedom and the total irreversible control of every man, woman and child and all of the humans who think they're something else on planet Earth. The work of the devil is about to have its final victory, at least for the present. But there is a God in heaven who will judge the earth during the great tribulation before the second coming of Christ. I praise God that the rapture will happen before the great tribulation. One week ago, I returned from a country where I spent five weeks observing the people with only a thin veneer of temporal freedom. But everywhere I went, there were cameras monitoring my coming and my going. I heard quiet conversations from people who had been pulled into the police stations for questioning. I heard whispered conversations about Chinese Christian believers who have been imprisoned, tortured, killed, and some of them have had their bodies carved up for organ transplants for others. Three years ago at this time, I had just returned from the same country under the totalitarian domination of atheistic communism, where I helped my daughter and her husband adopt two tiny children. It was, in a sense, a rescue operation to save two castaway children from death, oppressive authoritarianism, miserable lives, pagan philosophy, evolutionary indoctrination, and a vacuum where they would probably never hear the gospel. Returning to the United States both of these times made me realize just how blessed we are to have the political, economic, social, and religious freedoms that we so much enjoy here. And with great grief to see them evaporating before our eyes. But what is true freedom? The Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ speak of an even more valuable freedom that we have in the New Testament books of John and Romans. Physical freedom is an incredible blessing, but it's only temporary. It only lasts until we die. The Bible deals with the people who are truly free versus a people who are under the heavy hand of sin, the oppressive hand of legalism, and enslaved domination of trying to earn salvation by the works of the law. Slavery to the world, slavery to the flesh, slavery to the devil. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's the truth that makes you free. 
He goes on to explain that. The Jews answered him, We have the Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Freedom from the slavery of sin comes when you really know the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Temporal freedom can be taken away. Physical freedom can be taken away. <coughs> Economic freedom can be taken away. It will be during the tribulation. Political freedom can be taken away. Freedom of movement can be taken away. But there is a freedom which can never be taken away. The freedom that you have in Christ. The eternal life that God gives you, which can never be taken away. Do you have it? Do you have it? If you have it, what are you doing with it? Are you telling others about that freedom? If you spend any time on the internet, and I try not to, in fact, almost blessedly, when I got back from China, my little tablet wasn't working. I spent a day trying to get it to work. I even took it down to Best Buy, and they couldn't get it to work. I don't have to be on the internet unless I go up to the balcony <laughs> and use that very cumbersome computer there. But what are you doing to share your freedom with others? On the internet, you see people, you know, panicking over this issue. You've got all your survivalists. You've got all your Second Amendment right gun control people fighting back and forth. Uh, you've got all kinds of people there wondering about what's going to happen in the political elections and, you know, all the things that I've just talked about. And we see that happening around us. But there is a freedom that you have in Christ. A freedom that can give you peace even in an hour like this. Even in a country that's falling apart. Even in a place where the police may knock on your door in the night. When was the last time you told anybody about it? When was the last time, and you have the freedom to do this now, when was the last time you saw Jesus with somebody who was lost and who did not have freedom? Someone who was in the bondage of sin, slavery to the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons, who could not break free? When was the last time you told someone about a freedom that lasts forever? Our gracious Heavenly Father, How we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. And we think nothing of it. We take it for granted. We worry about our temporal freedoms, and indeed it is sad because the men and women who founded this country started with the scripture. And that's what gave them internal freedom. That's what gave them the freedom to stand against that which is contrary to your word. That is what gave them the strength to establish a declaration of independence and a constitution and laws that would promote divine righteousness, as Paul speaks of the purpose of government in Romans 13, that would suppress that which you call evil and would promote that which you call good. How have the mighty fallen? The torch has been passed to us and we've dropped it in the mud. 
the flame that was held high has been set aside by us who stopped to eat our penny candy. Forgive us, Father. We are your people. We're called by your name. We humble ourselves in your presence. We confess that we have sinned. We repent. Which means things are going to change for us as we move into this new week. Father, help us to understand Romans 13, how it applies to us as believers living in a country which has entered free fall in which the moral decay has reached almost the very bottom and cause us to be shining lights unashamed of the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It is sin that enslaves us, but the truth, believed, acted upon, obeyed, promulgated, and shared with all our hearts, it is the truth that makes us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 807, My Country Tis of Thee. We'll stand and sing all the verses.